In life, there are many paths to success. Some people are lucky enough to be able to take the path laid in gold, where every step is victory bound and any step placed awry is easily recovered from. Most people are unlucky enough to take the path laid with traps, struggles, and battles against insurmountable odds, where any wrong step results in total loss and crippling injury that may prevent another step from ever being taken. Then there's the people who step outside and pave their own path, brick by brick. It's slow, but it's safe. The destination may not always be decided when they set out, but they'll build the path as far as the road can take them, all in good time, and they'll just enjoy the ride for as long as they stay on it. Such is a philosophy I rather relate to when running this channel, so uh, if you like what you see here, maybe uh, hit that like and subscribe button to keep up with all my JRPG and niche gaming stuff, but uh... Yeah, back to the point. One company that fits squarely into that third category is that of simulation game, JRPG, and action RPG developers, Gust. Because of their unassuming entrance into this world, tracing their history back to their roots is a challenging task, obscured by the total lack of anybody really keeping track of or documenting their arrival. But I dug up what I could find and would like to present to you today, the history of Gust. An observation of perseverance, adherence, and brand recognition. But not before a word from our sponsor. Atelier Online Alchemists of Bressile is the latest, greatest, and atelier game for your mobile devices. Explore, gather, fish, and synthesize your way to victory with your favorite returning characters. Cozy worlds, a comfy atmosphere, character customization, familiar turn-based combat, and a whole new academy of bright-eyed students carrying the hopes of the future come together in a union of new and old to celebrate this long-running series. We've been waiting a long time for this game to arrive, and the time is finally upon us. Follow the link in the description below to download the game today and use the provided code to start your journey off right with some bonus rewards. Special thanks to Bulltrend2 for sponsoring this video and making it happen. If you like what you see, then send the love their way and jump into the world of Atelier Online today. Now, back to the video. To start this journey, we're going to need to travel all the way back to the 1970s. Following the release of the first commercially available microprocessor, the Intel 4004 in 1971, the value and necessity of computers was beginning to be realized. Thanks to their unique ability to perform high-level calculations and data storage, they became indispensable for business operations. However, computers still weren't that accessible or affordable, and very few people understood how to use them. So in 1973, a calculation center named Keiken Co. Limited, first founded in 1960 and located in Osaka, Japan, established a new subsidiary office in Nagano, aptly named Nagano Sales Office. Nagano Sales Office would be a division of the company focused on computer-based data creation. This endeavor would prove rather fruitful, and in 1974 they would be spun off into their own company called Keiken Nagano Data Center. Keiken Nagano Data Center would operate with a culture of enthusiasm, creativity, and sincerity. Such was their approach to business relations and creating successful business endeavors, something that would carry through to later projects founded within the company as well. In 1978, the data center began working on in-house app and program development. Come 1985, the office seen an upgrade in the form of the IBM System 38 computer, and also opened a new company branch in Sua City. In 1988, they expanded further, this time into Tokyo, also renaming their company to Keiken Engineering System to better reflect their 15 years of evolution. In the four years since they acquired the IBM System 38, the world of computing had changed drastically and Keiken, in 1989, invested and upgraded once again to the much more space-efficient Facom M730s. In August of 1992, the company would pivot once more and start in-house development on amusement-based software, i.e. video games. Fourteen months later, in October of 1993, they would officially launch a branch of their company for the sole purpose of video game development and sales. This company was called Gust, and is the main character in today's story. Gust was the first video game software development studio within the Nagano Prefecture of Japan. They never really had a foothold in the industry, and nobody with a strong understanding of the industry to guide them. For Kaken Holdings, this was entirely new territory. They had a small team of people to work on their games, and it was basically up to the whole team what they were going to make and how they were going to do it. From the very beginning, Gust worked by the idea that if the team wasn't interested in the game they were making, then the game wasn't getting made. It was very important to them that their games be a true team effort. 
Their first title was a little-known SRPG for PC-98 called The Story of King Eris, released on March 18th of 1994. The game was quite a bit different than what Gus would come to be known for later, mainly in what type of audience it was marketed towards, that being young men in search of a power fantasy adventure. A Schwarzenegger or Fabio-type warrior is pictured emblazoning the right side of the box, shirtless and gripping a sword, while a pure maiden clad in white with flowing blonde hair appears in the bottom left corner corner. The story of King Eris unfortunately didn't make much of a splash and remains region locked to Japan to this day. Seeking greener pastures, Gust would shift focus and direct their efforts to developing for Sony's new home console, the PlayStation. On June 23rd of 1995, they released their first console game, Falcata, Astron Padma no Manchu, or rather, Falcata, the Crest of Astron Padma. Falcata was another RPG, this one taking place in a more traditional historical setting. The game featured a rather innovative, morality and social system, where party members' opinions of you will change based on how you treat them and what sort of things you're willing to do for them. This realm of influence also extended to other NPC bands of warriors, where you can sow seeds of discord among them and in the chaos swoop in to recruit their members. But if you're not tending to the fires in your own backyard, then you may see your own troops abandon and betray you, joining other parties and perhaps even taking up arms against you at a later time. Like the story of King Eris, this title never left Japan. However, it was significantly more successful. Gust, of course, would follow this promising new trail and would develop for the Sony PlayStation exclusively for the next few years. Gust's very next game released on February 23rd of 1996, and it would be what they felt was their first big hit, and also see the introduction of one of this company's key players. Occupying a role in the animation department, Shinichi Yoshike would see his first credit on the Gust title, Welcome House. Welcome House was a departure for Gust, as this was not an RPG. RPG like their previous two titles. For all intents and purposes, this was a cartoon-esque adventure game. In a comedy of errors, players find themselves trapped inside their rich uncle's mansion on April Fool's Day. You maneuver throughout the mansion looking for an escape, collecting and using items to solve puzzles, all the while laughing at the obscene situations and slapstick comedy the game employs. There's no combat, and you can't die. The game was most notable at the time for the character animations and reactions, as this is what invited much of the comedy. Though to Today, this is a very rugged looking game, bringing to mind the early 3D efforts of other games like Alone in the Dark. Because of the game's success, however, Gus positioned Welcome House as their flagship series and started work immediately on the sequel, Welcome House 2. Welcome House 2 would release just under 10 months later, but not without another game in between, titled Meru Purana, another strategy game with combat that resembled that of Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. Welcome House 2 was more of the same as the first. Same characters, same locations, and same sort of setup, only now it takes place on July the 4th instead of April 1st. Of course, however, to up the ante, the traps, jokes, and situations were more frequent and more obscene. The biggest advancement this game made was the inclusion of voice acting. <laughs> Despite this being the intended flagship series and what Gust was really trying to put all of their focus into at the time, this would be the last Welcome House title, as Gust had a new star coming right around the corner. Five months from the release of Welcome House 2 would release the game that would change the course of their company for the foreseeable future. May 23rd, 1997, Atelier Marie, the Alchemist of Salberg, started one of the genre's most endearing and enduring series. Most of the ideas behind this game came from former Welcome Welcome House animator Shinichi Yoshike, and today he is seen as the man most responsible for creating the series. Shinichi always had a fascination with creating things, particularly with his hands, and this is a desire he wanted to represent in his new game. Thanks to some of his studies in college, he learned a great deal about the practice of alchemy, and so it was decided then that this would be the vehicle through which said in-game creation would happen. By gathering materials, players could mix and match them to create new items and gear. Much like being sat in front of a pile of randomly assorted Lego, players could feel the world of possibilities at their fingertips and they felt encouraged to dig into these systems and uncover what potential their characters could achieve. At the time of creating Atelier Marie, Shinichi was a big fan and heavily inspired by Lucy Maud Montgomery's 1908 novel, Anne of Green Gables, and its massively successful award-winning miniseries. From this inspiration, Shinichi envisioned his small, cozy world, and has also stated himself that the relationship between Marie and Shia 
Rebecca in this game was basically lifted from that of Anne and Diana from Montgomery's work. Thanks to the main cast of characters being primarily made of young, cute girls, Gust also managed to tap into a market of players that was previously not all that represented. Atelier Marie did not aim to sell to young men looking for power fantasies as the story of King Eris did, but to young men and women alike simply looking to spend time with characters in somewhat more grounded scenarios. At its inception, the Atelier series was focused more on the simulation aspects of the game, creating items, gathering materials, and just being a participant in this ever-evolving world. As the series would progress, it would adopt a heavier focus on fantasy and RPG elements, and the image of the game world would change to adapt to what was popular at the time, while still trying to retain its characteristically cozy atmosphere. Though it's tough to trace his history, this also seems to be where Daisuke Achiwa and other Gus Sound team members got their start. Although Daisuke also is credited on a 2015 soundtrack release for Welcome House 1 and 2, which was released as a part of a Gust 20th anniversary collection. Whether he is just credited for recomposing or composing the originals, however, I have not been able to confirm. Suffice to say though, this is where the characteristic Gust sound really got its start. A sound that of course has evolved with technology and the new talents joining the team, but a sound that became just as much a part of the company's image as their fantastic sprite graphics and their colorful and cozy worlds. Atelier Marie released at a very fortuitous time. The PlayStation was home to many great JRPGs, and with the advancement in technology it represented, many developers were experimenting with the genre and players were ready to go along for the ride. Atelier Marie was a huge hit by Gus standards. This success put new wind in their sails. From here on out, Atelier would be their flagship series, though Shinichi Yoshike would not be overseeing it, as he would depart from the company for a number of years. With this change in direction, Gus changed a lot of their image and would focus less on the 3D adventure games, but wouldn't be dropping them entirely. Aside from the already in development Karyujo, which released in September of 1997, they would release nothing but Atelier titles until July 1st of 1999, most of which would just be revisions of the first Atelier. On December 11th of 1997, they ported Atelier Marie version 1.3 to the Sega Saturn, their first non-PlayStation release in two years. On June 4th of 1998, they released an updated version of the game back to the PlayStation titled Atelier Marie Plus. Re-releases like this would become standard practice and a key component in Gus's ongoing success. On December 17th of 1998, the first Atelier sequel was released, Atelier Ellie, The Alchemist of Salberg 2. Ellie was very similar to the previous title with some new additions. Most notably, at the end of every in-game year, the player must do exams, a system that ultimately determines which of the 13 endings you'll acquire. Ellie also expanded the scope of the world, adding more towns and fields to gather from, as well as an increased focus on character backstories. This entry also served as the debut of Akira Tsuchiya, who lent the game his compositional expertise as a new member of Gust's sound team. Though the game was another success by Gust's standards, critics were not as warm to it as they were the first, feeling the ideas the second time around simply weren't as fresh or innovative, and many of the new ideas were not implemented the best. It would be years before a new Atelier release would be as critically acclaimed as the first entry. Gust was not deterred, however, and Salberg 3 quickly went into the early planning stages. In the time between Salberg 2 and 3, Gust released two more games for the PlayStation 1, titled Noir You Noir, Seelgris Phantasm, and Robin Lloyd's Adventure. The former an RPG in their usual style, the latter a detective adventure game with 3D graphics more akin to their earlier Welcome House titles. In April of 2000, both Salberg titles were ported to PC. In June of 2000, they released Hrashfeld to the PS2. Not only was this their first PlayStation 2 title, but it would also be Gustco's first game to travel outside of Japan. Thanks in part to its smaller script size and its 3D presentation, foreign localizers seen this as a rather cheap and easy game to take outside of Japan, and a pretty low-risk game to gamble on. So it's no shock this was the first to get such treatment from Gust's already extensive library. It wasn't all sunshine and roses, though. Sadly, the Western release of this odd futuristic racing game was cancelled, with only Hresfeld International Edition releasing in PAL territories as Jet Ion GP by March of 2002. The game wasn't received the best, but it wasn't a terrible seller either. PAL gamers just found the performance and control issues to be particularly debilitating. A PAL copy today on Amazon can sometimes be scored for as little as £3.
On June 21st of 2001, the Sawbird trilogy was finally completed with the release of Atelier Lily. Though this was the third release, the title was set 20 years prior to the events of Atelier Marie. It featured a host of new characters as well as younger versions of previously seen ones. Visually, the game was stunning, an all-around timeless aesthetic. However, despite its visual advances, there was still a number of things that prevented it from reviewing as well as the first. The biggest issue it seemed would be the importance of the in-game clock and the missable content title to it. Prior to now, this hadn't been too big of an issue. However, in expanding the scope of the content in Lily and making quest lines more obscure and hard to activate, players would constantly run into the problem of missing valuable pieces of information and character growth scenes that would leave them somewhat let down by the adventure by the time the credits rolled. Though future Atelier games would carry on with this mechanic for a while, Lily was the low point for its implementation and led to a lot of player frustration. Hot on the heels of Solberg 3, Gus would run into their biggest fiasco since their Inception, with the November 15th, 2001 dual pack release of Atelier Marie and Ellie on Sega Dreamcast handled by Cool Kids. For all intents and purposes, the port to Dreamcast was fine. However, an issue was discovered when players started putting the disc into their PC, which at the time was a good way to listen to soundtracks, but also given the ease of piracy on the Dreamcast, was a necessary step in dumping the ROMs. Those two general causes aside though, this release actually prompted you to put the game into your PC to unlock and install new Atelier-themed screensavers, which was one of many pieces of bonus content included in this re-release. So what happened next was especially disastrous. Unfortunately, the entire first print run of this dual pack was carrying what was known as the Kriz virus, a virus that would mysteriously sit dormant on a PC until December 25th, at which time it begins overriding files all throughout the computer right down to erasing important BIOS and CMOS data, effectively destroying any machine it touches. A very cruel sort of Christmas gift. After five days on the market, Cool Kids sent out a news bulletin warning of the virus. They offered refunds to those who wanted them and suggested players do at least one of three things. Absolutely avoid using the discs in their PCs, return them, or otherwise destroy them. Cool Kids promised a new downloadable wallpaper will be coming once the issue was tracked and solved. They also sent links to antivirus software along with their news bulletin. All copies of the game were pulled immediately from store shelves and it was believed at the time to be the first ever console game to ship with a virus. Overall, this was a PR nightmare, but one that Gus was probably thankful they weren't a bigger company yet to see spread much further. It simply was not something they wanted attached to the Atelier reputation, and thankfully Cool Kids was there to front most of the blow. Until 2002, Gus would release nothing but revisions, ports, and side stories to the first Atelier trilogy. On June 27th, they released Atelier Judy, The Alchemist of Gramnad, part one in what was a rare duology for the franchise. The Gramnad games, though very similar to their predecessors, sought to streamline and simplify some of the series mechanics, such as the combat and stat management systems, as well as opening up synthesis to be less restrictive and dependent on specificity, while also introducing the item trait system that became a staple in future games. Exploration was expanded and dungeons were given more of a focus with a neat mechanic tied into them, wherein if bombs and other such items do damage to the dungeon, the dungeon will eventually collapse. Once again, the game did not review as well as the first entry, and the experience was somewhat hampered by bugs, but it did at least kickstart some series staples and introduced new mechanics that made it stand out from other entries. Before the second Gramnad game would release and complete the duology, Gust released Taishu Mononoke Ubu Roku, another one-off sprite graphic turn-based RPG. Atelier Vioret, the second of the Gramnad games, released on June 27th of 2003. This game once again failed to reach the critical praise of the first and was promptly left behind with only the legacy of being part of a rare duology, and the last Atelier game before the big shift. Although it did serve as the entry point for Ken Nakagawa to start composing works for the mainline Atelier games alongside Daisuke Achua. Atelier Iris was the big shift for Gus, and a landmark title in their catalog, being the first in the series to make it out of Japan and in fact travel worldwide in the two years following its release. June 28th, 2005 marked the first time a Gus title would ever come to North America, and the start of a long-running relationship with the localizers NIS America. Though it didn't exactly dominate sales anywhere and received middling to okay reviews, it was the start of something special for a lot of people. For the next five years, every game Gus released would make its way to America and PAL territories, with the exceptions of ports of older titles such as the Marie and Ellie re-releases on PS2 in 2005, and a port of Manakemia 2 on the PSP in 2000. 
2009. As well as a couple other odd outliers. The other two parts of the Iris trilogy released on May 26, 2005 and June 29, 2006. Both would see diminishing returns in critical appeal, but helped solidify an audience around the world. An audience of people who still loved the cartoony sprite graphics of older JRPGs that many localizers seemed too disinterested in to take the risk during the rising appeal of 3D games. As the Iris trilogy was releasing, Gus launched another landmark series in collaboration with Ban Presto. On January 26 of 2006, Artanelica was released. This series would sadly not see a release in Australia, but then Gus representation over there has always been a little more spotty than other places. Looking ahead to the later release of Atelier Tutori Plus, that game got slapped with an R18 rating for high impact sexual violence. So there's little wonder why there was less enthusiasm among localizers in the area. And it remains to be seen how much struggle people had bringing these games over there before that. That aside, this game seen famed Gust sound team member Akira Tsuchiya step into a game design and directing role. An excellent position for a man of his talents as Artanelko's story and world worked in unison with the music on display. The music seen a number of composers working on it, not the least of which being Akiko Shikata, who gained her fame prior due to her original compositions and her work on Shadow Hearts from the New World. Though critics in the West found it lacked a real sense of epic storytelling and was overly easy, the gameplay motifs and ideas Ideas were widely embraced as fun and original. In Japan, the title was embraced much more openly. The sequel released a year and a half later in October of 2007 to much greater reception despite a rather problematic localization on behalf of NIS America. A localization that still affects NIS's reputation to this day. Though many see Artanelico 2 as the crowning jewel of Gust's catalog, this series was never particularly popular. The third and final mainline Artanelico would not release until 2010 on the PlayStation PlayStation 3, and suffice to say, it was not received well at all. The change to 3D, the oftentimes nonsensical story, and the lackluster combat did not win any new fans and left the returning ones disappointed. Though the mainline Artanelico series had ended, it would see spin off CL and Arno Surge, which released on PlayStation 3 and PS Vita. By 2014, it seemed this chapter of Gus's catalog had come to an end, though remasters of two entries were announced in 2020. In typical Gus fashion, once the Atelier I Iris series had wrapped, Artanelico wasn't the only thing on their plates. In June of 2007, they started a new alchemy-based adventure set within the Atelier universe titled Manakemia. Manakemia is an odd one for the Atelier series, mainly just due to its name not given the appearance of belonging. Yet it is considered the ninth mainline entry and introduced new ideas that became staples from there on out. Though combat was a focus of the game, RPG elements were somewhat stripped back, involving no XP systems for leveling, rather just a skill tree and a point system. Like most Gust games, Manakemia and its sequel got middling to okay reviews, though is remembered fondly by those who played it. Sadly, the second entry in the series was left out of PAL territories, though they did get the first. By 2009, Gust returned to using their franchise title, and the 11th game of the franchise would release on the PlayStation 3. Like Artanelico 3, this game would also see a number of changes while moving platforms. Atelier Rorona, the Alchemist of Ireland, seen the biggest departure to the series on identity yet, switching for the first time from 2D sprites to 3D character models and 3D environments. The game focused a little more on the RPG elements than previous entries had, and drifted deeper into the fantasy side of the universe than the series had ever done before. Reception to the game was mostly mixed again, but an old problem was beginning to seem like the biggest issue the series was facing. Players had long grown tired of the in-game timer. It was the source of much criticism, but at this point it was also a characteristic and long-standing feature of the the games, and it wasn't something Gust would want to let go of too quickly. Despite JRPGs having fallen from vogue during the early PS3 generation, Rorona managed to net over 200,000 copies sold worldwide, 120,000 of which were in Japan, making it a huge success for the time and for the franchise. The Ireland series would have three games at this point before getting revisited later. Atelier Totori and Atelier Meruru releasing in 2010 and 2011 respectively. Totori reviewed marginally better than Rorona and the sales reflected that, closing at 144,000 units sold in Japan alone. Meiruru unfortunately seen an overall drop in critical response, though another boost in sales, closing at 155,000 copies in Japan. However, that game's launch was not without its issues. Initially, when Meiruru launched in Japan, it had a Sarah rating of A, indicating that it was suitable for all ages, though that rating wasn't quite accurate. Sarah alleged that when Gust had submitted the game for
for rating, they had withheld content. The content that was not present for approval contained sexually suggestive themes, therefore requiring the rating to be bumped up to a B. At that point, Gust had to put a halt on all shipments of the game and put a new game content document together for Sero to re-evaluate. Because the rating would get bumped up, the current print of games would have to have their packaging swapped out to reflect the new rating, then be sent back out for sale. Given this was a month after release, most of the sales had already been processed, so there may still be more of the recalled versions circulating than the properly rated ones. Given Gust's quick turnaround on games, it seems entirely likely that this mistake was just that. A mistake. At this point, most Gust titles were getting shipped worldwide, and larger companies were beginning to take notice. And one of the people, of course, paying attention the most was one of their primary publishers and distributors, Koei Tecmo. Seeing the opportunity to spin Gust into something even more grand, Koei moved to buy out 100% of Gust stocks for a total of 2.2 billion yen. They then maneuvered the company to become a wholly owned subsidiary of theirs, pushing Kaken Holdings out of the picture entirely. Though Kaken Holdings never exactly intended this to be their main form of business, it was clear that this was their most profitable business venture. Without Gust, today, Cake and Holdings is worth 99 million yen. After the acquisition, Koei intended to have Gust double down on their game output and expand to developing more genres, something we wouldn't exactly see for many years to come. Despite new ownership, work on Atelier soldiered on as if nothing had changed. Gust wasted no time jumping into the next adventure with Atelier Aisha, the Alchemist of Dusk, in June of 2012. With this entry, Koei Tecmo had completely taken over publishing rights for the series in North America, thus ending their long-standing relationship with NIS America. With the Dust trilogy, Gust was starting to dig deeper into the RPG side of the series. The story was getting more focused, and the themes were starting to become more mature and adult-oriented. Though Atelier originally started with a premise of being a JRPG or simulation adventure game where you're not out to save the world, it was starting to take steps in that direction. Part of this was the result of what was popular at the time, and where the creators took inspiration from with things like Attack on Titan dominating Japanese media. Despite the new shift to a somewhat darker setting, the charming and wholesome nature was still there, but with a greater, more threatening aura behind it. Though this trilogy didn't hit its stride on the first century, the second was a massive critical success. Atelier Eska and Loggy Alchemist of the Dust Sky became the highest rated Atelier game since the series debut, and the highest in the West so far. Following a delay from June 28th to July 17th, 2014, to improve the game's quality, the Dusk series came to a close with the release of Atelier Shally Alchemist of the Dusk Sea. At this entry, Gust had adhered to the will of their growing fan base and dropped the traditional timer system, opting instead for the life task system, which still worked to encourage players to develop routines, but didn't give them the same sense of anxiety and impending doom those infernal clocks often introduce. This was a compromise really between the series' identity and what the fans wanted, but it would not be the last time this mechanic would be reconsidered. Though it received mostly praise, Shally's sales were decent, but not extraordinary. The next Atelier release would be a mobile game for Android and iOS called Atelier Quest Board in October of 2014. This never left Japan. Also in 2014, Koei Tecmo officially fully absorbed Gustco. From here, Gust re-released some of their games with additional content until releasing their new project, Knights of Azure, on October 1st of 2015. A new IP that played very similar to the PS3 title Folklore and their first effort to go to the PlayStation 4. Though its story was still one of enduring love between the two female leads set against a gothic backdrop, Knights of Azure was a particularly dark game for Gust, but such was the growing pains of all the recent team mergers going on behind the scenes. Knights of Azure was produced by Keisuke Kikuchi of Fatal Frame slash Project Zero fame. Of course, that series was wholly owned by Tecmo, who after their merger with Koei was eventually dissolved and their talent dispersed to Koei's remaining studios. Keisuke worked with many of Koei's studios in the subsequent years, sometimes for producing games with studios whose image didn't exactly match his creations. Though this could have also been the result of Koei's idea four years prior to have Gust expand into more genres. Though reviews were mixed, the near 80,000 in sales in Japan ensured a sequel would launch just a couple years later. In the meantime, however, it was time for the next Atelier trilogy to begin. On November 19th of 2015, Gust launched the Mysterious trilogy with Atelier Sophie, the Alchemist of the Mysterious Book. Moving away from the Dust trilogy, they wanted to return to the more 
lighthearted nature the series had originally employed. Gust hired Yugen, famed illustrator from the Bravely Default games, and Noko of Cancol fame in an attempt to better target the tone they were aiming for with Atelier Sophie. The Atelier games are starting to become larger at this point, and thanks to the popularity of current Bethesda games, people were becoming more interested in exploring larger, more open worlds. So by the second entry in this trilogy, the in-game environments began to cater to that, ever so slightly dipping their toes into the sensibilities of open world games, but not quite diving fully into them. Atelier Fury was also part of a new push by Gust they dubbed the Beautiful Girls Festival, a run of games featuring mainly beautiful women. The final game in the mysterious trilogy, Atelier Liddy and Suelle Alchemist of the Mysterious Paintings, launched in December of 2021, and would be Gust's first title on the Nintendo Switch. Overall, the trilogy was a little lacking for sales and reception, despite an outpouring of love from pockets of the fan base. And though the final entry being on the Switch ideally should have helped with the sales, neither the Switch nor Vita versions hit the top 20 on Japan's charts. Just before the Mysterious trilogy came to an end, Gust also released the sequel title, Knights of Azure 2 Bride of the New Moon, and a new, rather unassuming IP called Blue Reflection. Both games were included as part of Gust's Beautiful Girls Festival. At the time of recording, Knights of Azure 2 is the final entry in the short-lived series, sacrificing the original combat of the first game for a more streamlined action focus, Knights of Azure would once again have a hard time finding a solid audience. And though the reception was mixed, sales were alright for a niche title. Blue Reflection, the final entry in the Beautiful Girls Festival, was Gust's answer to a Persona type game, featuring turn-based combat and social elements in a school setting, taking narrative and design influence from Magic Knight Ray Earth and Sailor Moon. Blue Reflection scored middling reviews, but found a dedicated audience within its intended demographic. Sales of the game were pretty lackluster, leading it to become one of many Gust games that command a high price in the aftermarket. Although it seemed to be a one-off title for a while, following fan feedback, Gus went ahead with their initial plans and a sequel was announced in 2021 titled Blue Reflection Second Light. In addition to this, they also announced Blue Reflection Sun, a Japan-only mobile game and a tie-in anime. In 2019, Gus launched Nelk and the Legendary Alchemists, Ateliers of the New World. This was a spin-off title created to celebrate the series' 20th anniversary. The idea was to represent all the past Atelier games and have a full cast and crew of alchemists. However, this is something Gust had admittedly struggled with in development, and the fans clearly felt that. Though the critic reviews were okay at best, fans by and large were not impressed. Not with the character interactions, nor the format of gameplay. While there were still elements of what made Atelier what it was, everything else gave more of an impression of something better suited for a mobile game. Only three months past this, Atelier Lelua the Scion of Arland released, a rare fourth entry for an Atelier series. Lelua was a strange entry for Gust and a strange one for Gust fans. Being a return to an old series that's seen two trilogies and many other games released since its last installment, Lelua kinda takes a few steps back into its somewhat abandoned series history. While the game looked the best the series has ever looked and the ease of exploration and quality of life was at an all-time high, many players were bothered by some returning, outdated mechanics. Despite this, however, Lelua was still one of the best critically reviewed games on Metacritic up to this point though the user reviews were not quite as kind to it. Six months to that game's release and just nine to the release of Nelk, a third new Atelier released and brings us to Gus's current works. Atelier Ryza, Ever Darkness, and The Secret Hideout. Atelier Ryza seen a big leap forward for the series from top to bottom. The visuals picked up where Lulua left off, only more refined. The RPG elements got a greater focus than ever before and the synthesis between both entries seen some new quality of life improvements and a moderate mechanic overhaul. The characters too were immediate crowd pleasers and made for excellent early marketing material. Atelier Ryza 1 reviewed very well for the series and sold over half a million copies, going on to be not only the best selling entry to date, but selling more than most combined trilogies had previously. Atelier Ryza 2 put even more focus on its storytelling in dungeons, becoming the most RPG-like an Atelier entry has ever been to date, and made slight improvements over its predecessor seeing once again handsome rewards in the process. Sales like what Gus seen for Atelier Ryza was unlike anything in the company's history. It was a success they could have hardly dreamed of when they started their company nearly 30 years before. It's a success they likely would have not achieved without their fundamental beliefs and their strategy, completely focused around perseverance, adherence to fan feedback, and growing brand recognition. It may seem in this video that we just looked at a bunch of historical pinpoints for the company, but there's a very solid and simple observation we can make that I believe makes Gus a company 
very worthy of respect. As the industry grew, Gus listened and they learned. Though they never had the money to play in the same ballpark as the big kids along the way, they worked with what they had and with laser sharp focus kept growing their audience. Once they developed something they enjoyed making and people enjoyed playing, they focused on continually refining it, attempting to turn it into the best thing it could be according to player feedback. Progress was slow, but methodically so. With rare exception, things were never changed so dramatically at once that they risked alienating their fan base. Despite all the iterations to their main series formula, they never lost the characteristic appeal that helped establish their fan base in the earliest of days. Though we can look at the success of a franchise that changes drastically from entry to entry, such as that of Final Fantasy, we can look to Gust to see that the near opposite approach reaps its own rewards. Gust paved their own way to success, one patiently laid brick at a time. They never tried to operate on a bigger scale than what they were. This was not a race. They never tried to appeal to an audience that maybe wouldn't be into what they were already doing. Gust had the foresight to reap the benefits of a successful flagship series, but not put all of their eggs into that one basket. They expanded into new creative endeavors intelligently, many of which were headed by their in-house staff regardless of what position a staff member may have had previously. They believed in their fans, their staff, and the slow, steady, patient, and safe approach. They persevered despite always being several steps behind in the industry. They adhered to the wishes of their fans as they knew without them they had nothing, and they grew a brand you can recognize at a single site or sound. They found their success in a way I find personally inspiring. They are evidence of the idea that no matter how small someone might feel at the start of their journey, they too can become giants, paving their own way to success with little more than an open mind, a willingness to listen, to adapt, and to take their time making sure they place every brick precisely where it belongs. And once more here at the end, if you liked learning about this company's history, why not celebrate it with a game that's designed to do just that? The latest Atelier game to touch down in North America, Atelier Online. It's been over four years since we first heard about this game, and it is finally here. If you're interested, waste no time checking out that link in the description below, as well as the reward code, and join me in this celebration of the series' history. Thanks once more to Bulltrend for making this happen, and thank all of you for watching. So yeah, that was my brief look at the history of Gust, and I do mean brief. Kinda wish I made time for the Atelier DS games and like the Game Boy games, but it was already long enough as it is. Um, anyway, here's a slug I filmed. See y'all next time.